Hey everyone, so I've made clear in previous videos that I very much support the Occupy movement. Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Sydney now, I think it's an excellent thing and it's an excellent conversation that we need to have. To me, it should be about dialogue, it shouldn't be about apportioning blame, it should be about finding the faults in the system. You know, like they say, hate the game, don't hate the player, and I think that's very applicable in this case. Um, and, you know, we... I think the fundamentals of Occupy Wall Street are top 1% control 40% of the wealth and it's gotten to the point that the rest of society is really starting to feel that wealth disparity in various ways and a lot of the rest of society is actually facing conditions that are getting tougher, they're facing longer working hours, uh, less access to medical care, um, more problems financing education and so on and so forth and when it gets to that stage people you know that's when you usually find movements like this arise and I think that's a great thing I mean my personal view is that um, we could have gotten started a little bit earlier but it's coming and that's a that's that's a very very good thing but you know I think we have to ask ourselves where is it gonna go and where is it gonna end because we've had movements like this before and then we get some reform we get some you know we get some uh, labor laws or you know something some financial reform some tweaks to the system things settle down things get better and then we just back off that's at least what's happened um, all the times before and you know the, the things that led to uh, labor rights um, and things like that and to stronger unions were all such struggles and then we took the foot off the pedal and I think that's regrettable for two reasons. The first is because obviously after a while uh, all of those same rights come under attack again and the movements and the organizations that helped achieve those rights have then disappeared, have petered out because people weren't interested because they were doing well enough. And then and then that just, you know, that means that these the people who are interested in overthrowing those things have a much easier time at it. The other problem is that, you know, it always takes people to be directly affected by something. Um, it's because the top 40% control, uh, sorry, the top 1% control 40% of the wealth. But when you look at the world as a whole, the situation has been much worse than that for a long time for most of the people. Um, at, for the world as a whole, the top 10% control 90% of the assets. And the top, uh, the bottom 50% of the world population control 1% of the total wealth. The bottom half has 1%, a hundredth of the total wealth. This is a situation which is not new. It's a situation that's been around forever and ever. And I mean, those are just numbers. But the problems associated, we all know about them. We all know about the hunger. We all know about the poor access to medical care, we know about the children that die, and we know about the poor educational opportunities and the poor work opportunities. Um, but when it was those countries that were struggling, the the solutions that were being bandied about by, by our leaders always seemed good enough. Sure, we'll give them a bit of capitalism, uh, you know, the World Bank will go in and they'll crack some heads and open up some markets and over time it'll fix itself right I mean it may take 50 years but that's probably necessary pain and they just need to go through it and then they'll be much better off uh, but when it comes to us you know the people are still saying the same thing oh it's just an adjustment just relax but we won't relax because we're and we're right we shouldn't take this because it's unnecessary and people just telling us that's how it has to be isn't good enough. We have to think, is it really how it has to be? We have to at least have that discussion. And if we see that there's this kind of disparity, then we know that there is something that could be done because these things could be better distributed and better managed. For the whole world, that has always been the case. We could be doing so much more against hunger, against death by malaria, against the spread of AIDS, against the, the terrible impoverishment and all of the poor educational conditions and all of the other terrible things that then lead to great strife and war 
and millions of deaths in the Congo and so on and so forth. I'm not saying they're easy issues to fix, but we could be doing a lot to address them. And I mean, I remember they were saying for a handful of billions of dollars, you could, you could, you know, make huge strides towards stopping the spread of AIDS, towards eliminating a huge amount of um, malaria deaths, to eliminating all of the deaths associated with, with uh, water supplies that are poisoned that cause uh, a lot of children to die. But that does not not only not generate a mass movement, that generates nothing. Uh, that generates, a co you know, that generates sometimes a bit of outcry and a couple of donations, but it never creates a challenge to the system because we're not directly involved, right? We're not the ones that are being affected. But as soon as we are really directly affected, and we're not dying, our children aren't dying in those numbers, we're, we're starting to feel it, and life is starting to get significantly harder, and that's why we hit the streets. But it would be so nice if in solidarity we actually uh, did the same kind of thing for all of the people that for so much longer have been suffering so much more than us as well. I'm not saying stop Occupy Wall Street and just say, you know, let's, let's fix the rest of the world first. I think we can fix, we can try to fix or at least try to think about fixing everything at once. But I'm just hoping that when if we manage to get this to a stage where we start the thought process about our own society and about the way we want our society to be structured, we can at least not stop thinking there and also start thinking about the relations that our first world nations have with other nations. The trade relations, do they have to be as ruthlessly competitive when we're the clearly the superior force that can swamp markets and thereby destroy economies? Do we really have to exploit those nations for their resources? Or could we pay a fair price for them? Um, could we really be doing a little bit more, spending a little bit more money, just a couple of billion dollars, to make a huge impact in the lives of other people uh, that are suffering from this enormous wealth disparity, which is exactly what we're railing against. Um, and if we, the people of the industrialized nations, are losing out to corporations who buy our politicians, these people are entirely unrepresented in all the places that matter. Uh, their own leaders are <laughs> obviously bought off so many different ways, it's not even funny, but even if they weren't, they have no power. They don't sit in the places that control the world capital, that control all of the industrial might. 